This is In The Loop, I'm Christian Bryant. During today's ad breaks, I'll be trying to sort out how to expense one of those plexiglass dividers. You can never be too safe, even in an empty newsroom. Here's what we got for y'all. Tonight, a look abroad at how Europe is handling its own battle against this global pandemic. And we ask what's next for movie theaters in Hollywood after a major chain closes its doors indefinitely. But first, here's what you need to know. The vice presidential debate tonight in Salt Lake City looks a little different. The Commission on Presidential Debates installed plexiglass shields between the two candidates and the moderator to lessen the risk of spreading COVID-19. And Kamala Harris and Mike Pence were just over 12 feet apart and roughly the same distance from the moderator, Susan Page. It comes after a coronavirus outbreak has torn through the White House, infecting the president and at least 10 others close to him who currently have the coronavirus. The next presidential debate is still scheduled for next Thursday, and although President Trump says he's feeling fine, he's still within the time frame for symptoms and spreading the virus. On Tuesday, Joe Biden suggested canceling the debate if the president is still contagious next week. Even with talks scrapped for broader economic relief, a standalone relief bill for airlines could be in the works. Today, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin discussed the possibility. There's been bipartisan support in both the House and Senate for a $28 billion clean extension of the payroll support program that the airlines say would prevent involuntary furloughs until March of 2021. The program expired last week. Without federal aid, airlines will be forced to furlough and lay off tens of thousands of employees. On Tuesday night, the president stopped all hopes of a second broad stimulus package before the election, but later said he would support relief for airlines. Public health experts are urging Americans to stay vigilant against COVID-19 as half of all states are seeing an increase in coronavirus cases. Health experts say that's not ideal as we head into the colder months and gear up for holiday get-togethers. Maybe just have immediate family. Make sure you do it in a way that people wear masks where they have and you don't have large crowds of people. You know, I'd like to say that everything is gonna be great by Thanksgiving, but honestly, I'm not so sure it is. This week, the CDC acknowledged that airborne transmission is possible which means the virus can infect people who are more than six feet apart, especially indoors with poor ventilation. The CDC still says the main spread of the virus happens when someone is in close contact with an infected person. The agency defines close contact as within six feet of a sick person for at least 15 minutes. Health experts have warned of an impending crisis as some parts of the world head into cooler months during this pandemic. Much like in the US, cases are on the rise in parts of Europe. But instead of just locking everyone down, which is what happened and is happening in some places, experts are calling for a much more balanced response to the pandemic. Newsy's Ben Shimiso explains. And to implore citizens not to let their guards down. We want uh, to keep the economy moving, uh, but the only way we can do that is if we all uh, follow the guidance and uh, and depress the virus. Smith says governments should come up with carefully balanced guidelines that keep countries as open as possible while keeping the virus under control. We really do have to look at this quite carefully as to what we're willing to do before, quite literally, the pill becomes worse than the ill. He warns against imposing measures that people already hurt economically or mentally would deem too repressive especially if they are announced without an exit strategy. They won't comply meaningfully, and these measures will just become more and more laborious, more and more complicated. In Madrid, the region in Europe currently most affected by the virus, non-essential travel in and out of the city has been prohibited for 15 days. In Paris, all bars have been ordered closed for at least two weeks. And in parts of northern England, it is now illegal for millions of people to socialize indoors with other households. Ben Chamiso, Newsy. I'm creating applications for my winter pod to stay safe during the cooler months of this pandemic. Dogs or humans with dogs are encouraged to apply. It's that time of the year again when the Norwegian Nobel Committee announces some of its prize winners, which means I'm gonna to talk to you about something I'm not actually smart enough to talk about. Here's what's trending. The Nobel Prize in Chemistry was just awarded to Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer A. Doudna, 
for their discovery of the CRISPR-Cas9 genetic scissors, basically a highly precise tool for genome editing that gives researchers the ability to change the DNA of animals, plants, and other organisms. Yeah, it's, it's a great discovery, and I'm uh, very happy to be one of the pioneers of this uh, discovery. Charpentier of France and Doudna of the US have been leaders in the field of gene editing for a while now. Having discovered the CRISPR-Cas9 tools in 2012 and providing a breakthrough in life sciences. But for an award that often honors advances in science decades after the fact, this award for the two scientists came relatively quickly. The genetic scissors were discovered just eight years ago, but have already benefited humankind greatly. There are still some ethical questions around certain uses of genome editing, such as in humans, but the technology's main uses have been in plant breeding and treating genetic diseases. And in the long term, it could be used to cure many genetic diseases altogether. Charpentier and Doudna are the sixth and seventh women to win the Nobel Prize in Chemistry and the first to win jointly. We don't love highlighting somebody's demotion, but this one's got Twitter jumping. The Washington football team decided to bench starting quarterback Dwayne Haskins and replace him with Kyle Allen after a one and three start this season. But that isn't it. Haskins apparently dropped to the number three quarterback with Alex Smith being bumped up to number two. Haskins performance hasn't been great. In his 11 starts since joining the Washington football team, he's completed less than 60% of passes, thrown for 11 touchdowns and 10 interceptions. But his benching, especially after throwing for a career high the previous week, got the speculation mill churning. Was something going on behind the scenes? Other quarterbacks like Sam Darnold and Daniel Jones aren't doing great either. Why do they still have their starting jobs? Why is it black quarterbacks seemingly operate with a much shorter leash? Haskins was celebrated at the beginning of the season for being one of 10 starting black quarterbacks in week one, a record. But honestly, with COVID-19 taking down players and scattering previously scheduled games, nothing is for certain this season. And unfortunately, that includes job security. Fans have been paying tribute to rock music legend Eddie Van Halen since his death this week. And part of that homage has come in the form of remembering some of the guitarist's achievements outside of the iconic band that shared his name. For example, the time Eddie Van Halen effortlessly created one of the most iconic guitar riffs of all time on Michael Jackson's Beat It after less than an hour in the studio. He also held three different patents on various guitar gizmos, including one that allowed him to hold the guitar hands-free and just do some really wild things with sound. Basically, this guy wasn't just the lead for one of the all-time greatest rock bands. He was a musical innovator. Eddie Van Halen died of cancer Tuesday at the age of 65. You know that Denzel Washington gif from Malcolm X where he slams his hand on the desk? Yeah, that's me every time I hear an upcoming film has been pushed back. Just livid. As Newsy's Casey Mendoza reports, without any new releases... The prognosis is pretty grim for theaters and their ability to weather this pandemic. After Regal Cinema's decision to temporarily close, it's clear that movie theaters are still struggling to keep their doors open during the pandemic. As social distancing measures continue, the National Association of Theater Owners says the industry needs two things to stay afloat, new releases and federal support. We need the studios to sort of understand that there's never going to be a perfect market as long as we've got COVID-19 out there. And even with that, um, we are going to need help from the federal government. The association's Save Your Cinema movement calls on Congress to provide financial relief to cover existing expenses. The industry employs more than 150,000 people, and even though some theaters began reopening in August, it was at lower socially distanced capacities with fewer hours for workers and very few new movies to reel in audiences. At the same time, health experts are still warning consumers about the uncertainties of crowds and enclosed spaces, and states like New York haven't yet lifted their lockdowns on theaters. And we're looking right now at the possibility of about two thirds of movie theaters having to close 
in the next few months. Uh, it won't necessarily be permanent, but they will probably have to lay off workers. They will quite possibly have to reorganize, you know, financially. Some may go out of business. Cinema chains still in business like AMC and Cinemark are instituting mask requirements, social distancing guidelines, modified concessions, and enhanced cleaning procedures. But despite those efforts, industry leaders still say new releases are key to survival. We, we can say all we want, that we're open and that we've got these safety protocols, but if there's no movies, people aren't going to pay attention. Films like Disney's Mulan went straight to streaming this summer, while other titles like Warner Brothers' sci-fi epic Dune was pushed back almost an entire year, from December 2020 to October 2021. The latest blow to theaters, delaying the release of a new James Bond movie, for the second time, to the spring of 2021. If a year from now we've lost a lot of theaters or have lost a lot of audience, uh, it's not going to be good for those movies that they're holding back. So everybody needs to take a little bit of pain right now, and, and things will be better down the line. Casey Mendoza, Newsy, Chicago. <sighs> Anybody got a movie projector I can borrow? We're less than 30 days away from an election where more people are eligible to vote by mail than ever before. As we've seen in some places like North Carolina, if vote by mail requirements aren't met when you submit your ballot, it can be rejected. If that happens, is your state required to notify you? Newsy Stephanie Lieber again helps answer that question in this installment of our Vote Smarter 2020 series. If your mail-in ballot gets rejected, will you be notified? A lot of states allow voters to track their ballots and, and they can find out whether they've been sent and, and, and received, but only about 15 states, I think it is, actually tell you whether it's been accepted or rejected. It's a voter's responsibility to diligently fill out their mail-in ballot and return envelope correctly, but at least 20 states notify voters if their ballot is rejected, giving them a chance to fix the error. In North Carolina and New York, this process is new. It's going to happen in North Carolina this time for the first time as a result, um, but people should be uh, have the opportunity to correct what usually are just um, small mistakes. States vary in how they notify absentee voters of a problem. To protect your ballot, experts say you should make sure your local elections officials have multiple ways to contact you. You probably saw on your absentee ballot request or maybe on your registration form, they were asking for your cell phone number and your email address. And I know that a lot of voters are concerned about giving that kind of information. The reason they need that information is for this curing process so they can get to you quickly so that you can you can correct your ballot um, error or your ballot envelope error uh, and get it counted before Election Day. Stephanie Liebergen, Newsy, Miami. This year, U.S. wildfires have burned nearly 8 million acres so far. And every fire season, some U.S. states deploy inmate firefighters to help battle the blazes. Inmate firefighter programs operated through a state's Department of Corrections can't always help inmates become professional firefighters post-release, which is a criticism of the program, but some, like the one we're about to see in Oregon, have been successful in making sure inmates don't end up right back where they started. National reporter Alexa Liako has more. 11 years. 10 years. 72 months. These men are serving a sentence. We're all in here for different reasons. For a moment that's changed a lifetime. Manslaughter, man one, unauthorized use of a firearm. A drunk driving accident killed one of my really good friends, so so I've been paying for that for the last 15 years. Some moments still too painful to talk about. I'd rather not, I'd rather not discuss that. Um, I, it, it, was, it was just a terrible circumstance. But all their paths led here to the South Fork Forest Camp in Oregon. <laughs> you won't see barbed wire, there is no fence. It's a special prison facility partnered with Oregon's Department of Forestry, a facility filled with men fighting for a second chance. Not everybody that comes to prison is a bad person. People make mistakes. Don't judge people on a particular time in their life, judge them on their whole life. Places like this really do help people get back on the right track. Men who have less than four years left to serve can come here to get job training 
all while serving the local community. The training comes in many forms. The Coast Crew coming up. Every morning before sunrise, the inmates trained in firefighting head out into the community to protect families' homes. This summer, wildland fire crews have relied heavily on inmate crews for help. I like going out there helping our community. We're human beings. We're all we're trying to do the right thing. But not everyone is on the fire line. Some inmates focus on the tree line, learning forest management. Others are in the shop learning carpentry and mechanic work. And many work in the camp hatchery. Last year we raised approximately 110,000 fish. For Aaron Gilbert, the chance to step outside his cell was the beginning of a new chapter. I've been in a maximum security prison for the last 13 years, so I just came out here about a year ago. I remember when I got off the bus here, and my eyes, it was hard for him to adjust. It was so green. Gilbert is working each day for just a few dollars towards a future he can now see clearly. I've been able to pay back some of my uh, debts to society here. And so I just, I want to get out and live, live a simple life and, and do the right thing and be a productive member of society. That's, and that's something this place will really teach you. And on top of getting hands-on job training in skills they can use as soon as they get out of prison, this camp found that their recidivism rate is much lower than other correctional facilities in the state. When we put someone through our work program and they return back to society, that they're not going to re-enter this system. They're going to have the skills, the knowledge, the abilities, and just the working capacity uh, to continue to be a productive member of society. The Oregon Department of Corrections says every inmate costs taxpayers an average of $40,000 per year. So South Fork is helping save the community money by keeping people from reoffending, and it's creating a well-trained workforce with a pipeline to possible jobs. All these guys that are here are going to get out and they're gonna be our neighbors. You know, and so that we want them, you know, to be successful. These men know success starts with redemption, and now they're equipped to chase it. A lot of people will say the prison system breaks you down. This place helps build you up. I'm Alexa Liaco. If you haven't already, go ahead and shoot us a message on Twitter using the hashtag Newsy in the Loop. I'll give you a minute and some change to say something nice starting now. Parts of the country that were spared from high coronavirus cases earlier in the year are now seeing a concerning level of increases. And there's this issue. Health officials are worried about the winter months when activity moves indoors and the flu season kicks into high gear. Newsy's Amber Strong gives us an overview of where we are in the fight against COVID-19. COVID-19 cases are on the rise in parts of the country, and that's not what health officials want to see heading into the winter months. In the Midwest, states like Nebraska are seeing record high hospitalizations. And in New York... Nothing we want to do, but the kind of thing we need to do... Leaders are closing non-essential businesses in certain areas and implementing limitations on capacity in houses of worship after recent spikes in Brooklyn, Queens, and the suburbs. This week, Johns Hopkins University marking more than 210,000 dead from COVID-19. This as the CDC joins scientists around the world in recognizing the virus can be airborne and spread more than six feet indoors, but calling the instances limited. Dr. Anthony Fauci issuing this warning ahead of the winter months. When you go into the fall and the winter, the weather's colder, you tend to be indoors. When you're indoors, it becomes more problematic to be able to block the transmission of infection. The White House has been a real life example of how contagious the virus is, with the president, first lady, aide Hope Hicks, press secretary Kayleigh McEnany, and former advisor Kellyanne Conway among the litany of people in and around the administration infected with COVID-19. The World Health Organization estimates 10% of the world's population have been infected with COVID-19, but adds the vast majority are still at risk. Amber Strong Newsy, Northern Virginia. We don't always follow traditional TV news conventions on this show, clearly, but we wanted to point this one out. It's called a kicker or a more upbeat story to end the show. We're not doing this to book in the show with something that'll make you feel good. It's just a hilarious story that we feel like sharing. And if you do feel good about it, that's a plus. With in-person activities restricted a bit during the pandemic, gaming has flourished. 
National reporter Dan Grossman explains how that increase could be attributed to a new generation of gamers. Back in 1975, uh, my car was in the shop. It was a Saturday. Perhaps you're wondering why in a story about video games. The one that went viral. Yeah. <laughs> Am I laughing with a 67-year-old Navy war veteran about his time in the service? After 15 minutes of loading the disc tape in. Simple. I got to play the game and I never looked back. Okay, here we go. It's what got him here. I like games like that, that where they they test your mental ability. Did I say you can come in my house? You didn't knock on the door. Known simply by his online alias, Grandpa Gaming, this is video of him in action. A man who might be the last person you'd expect to log 100 hours a week streaming video games to more than 200,000 people worldwide on a website called Twitch. The older generations are coming out of the woodwork. And it's an audience that has rapidly grown since March. My note of my Twitch notifications, uh, the statements say, oh, you're... Uh, your followers have increased 200%. According to the market research group NPD, Americans spent nearly $11 billion on video games in the first quarter of this year, the most ever. They were also watching more, as Twitch reported people watched one and a half billion hours of gameplay on their service in April, a 50% increase from the previous month. When your kid is home all day, every day, uh, you need something to do. <laughs> to Iowa State psychology professor Doug Gentile, the why is pretty straightforward, but the reasons behind it connect to something inherently embedded within each of us. For example, there's a theory of human motivation called self-determination theory, and it says that humans have an ABC of basic needs. A, autonomy. We like to be in control. B, belonging. We want to feel connected. And C, competence. We want to feel like we're good at what we're doing. People come together because they want to share their experiences. What better way to satisfy all those needs that were stripped by the pandemic than a skill-based activity played with other people and a controller in hand? They want to do something, and this is a way of fulfilling that need. To Grandpa, it fills another need as he makes money off of what he does. This is the million-dollar question, what's going to happen? I think the first people to cash in on a million dollars are going to be the gaming industry. Uh, <laughs> And they've just gotten a whole bunch of new customers. Just not as much as the video game companies who will likely parlay these gains into the future. I'm Dan Grossman reporting. That's it for us, gang. As always, thanks for watching. We'll be back for more In The Loop tomorrow. Same time, same place. Top stories from Newsy are headed your way right now.